so um, um, yeah so, so, so let's see so, so before we before we get to the long lived modes uh, maybe some comments about what what in general we are <coughs> uh, we are doing uh, we um, I mean, we want to understand transport in the regime which is d dominated by, by interactions, but also scattering, scattering at boundaries and so forth. And so the approach we use for that, it's, it's a very complicated problem, right? And the approach we use for that is to break it in simpler, uh, smaller, uh, smaller problems and you know, handle them one by one and then construct the solution of the entire problem by combining what we learned <coughs> in, uh, by, by looking at those smaller, uh, s smaller problems. And so small, smaller problems are as, as, as follows. We uh, can uh, start, as we discussed yesterday, uh, trying to understand two-body collisions. And for two-body collisions, there are, uh, there are uh, excitations, which we can think about, if, you know, we, we had it on the board yesterday, but let me put it here again. Uh, you can think about energy excitation as some kind of uh, harmonic modulation on the Fermi surface, right? And so that, that would be M equal, M equal 5, maybe. Um, and then for each, uh, for each harmonic, uh, the w waveform is something like that, and then uh, th th this harmonic, uh, th th this mode will be an eigenfunction of the collision operator, uh, linearized, uh, linearized um, uh, near equilibrium, and there will be some eigenvalues that uh, one can calculate by studying linearized collision operator, and. Um, one question uh, is, and, and it's an interesting question we'll talk about today, is how to mm, how to understand these gamma, gamma m's, what you know, what what they look like, how they behave, and uh, so so forth, right? And then uh, once we once we know that, we can go in this basis, delta f m. Uh, behaving like a circular uh, cylindrical harmonic. And then in this basis, we can solve, uh, solve um, a transport equation with a collision operator diagonal in the basis of delta f uh, of, of, these, of these, these harmonics. And then from that, uh, from that get, uh, get a response function, uh, get conductivity. And uh, the, uh, there is a very nice expression for conductivity that one can get by doing the problem on this basis, it looks like a continued, uh, it looks like a Drude, uh, Drude model, but with a k dependent, uh, wave number dependent uh, scattering rate. And this wave number dependent scattering rate is given by a continued fraction, uh, continued fraction uh, written in terms of these, uh, in terms of these gammas, um, so that at zero k, and this r is k square basically, and so it's zero k, you forget about that, you get ohmic limit, and then if you take if, if gamma one, momentum relaxing scattering is, 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 is absent, uh, you, 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 you have, in the long wave limit, you have the viscous limit, and you can get kinematic viscosity from that. So, so we discussed all of that yesterday, not, uh, no need to repeat. Um, and then uh, that response function to, uh, in an infinite system, to to, to some uh, harmonic uh, excitation, which is a pl plane wave, uh, one can use to then go on to specific geometry and solve for how current flows in a specific geometry. And uh, we will, we, we'll, you know, we looked yesterday at the example, at the example, oops, at, at this example, uh, transport through a slit. Uh, and for that geometry, uh, one, one can you know, take, uh, take uh, non-local conductivity and then apply boundary conditions and then, and then from that get, uh, get some integral equation that, that you solve to find the current flow. 
and it, it, it's, it's another non-trivial problem, but, but combining, combining uh, what you learned by solving for gamma m's and then expressing conductivity through gamma m's and then, and then relating non-local conductivity to, uh, to transport and specific geometry, you can, you, can get, uh, you can get all the information you want about how current flows in, the, in, in a specific geometry. And, and I think, I mean, th this approach uh, we w developed in order to understand transport in the regime that we were interested in, but it, it's pretty general. If you, uh, if you have some way of predicting non-local conductivity, uh, you can then use it as a tool and you know predict uh, predict transport in any uh, in any geometry you want. So basically, uh, if I know the local conductivity with this approach, give me the geometry and we'll find uh, we'll find we'll find current distribution and so forth, potential distribution, or whatnot. Um, so you know w w we're going to use it again today for a different geometry. Uh, but maybe as a comment on, uh, one more comment on what we discussed yesterday, and also there were poster presentations r related to that. Um, in constrictions that you know, we, we were studying, uh, current exhi exhibits interesting distribution uh, that reflects the microscopic uh, character of transport. So for example, if you, Actually, let me show you. I wasn't planning to talk about it in, in a lecture, but because uh, it came up already yesterday, and will, I'm sure will come up again today, uh, let, me, uh, let me show you this. So this is a junior thesis of a uh, lead author in that you know, super ballistic conduction paper. Uh, that, that sh shows, using more or less this approach, shows uh, how current distribution looks like in, uh, in, in the slit geometry as a function, you know, as a function of various parameters. So, so for example, if you, uh, you know, if you have that uh, model that we discussed yesterday, that you know, all, all gammas are equal, so this one is zero because momentum is conserved and all, all, all other gammas are equal, and then they're equal and scale with temperature is t squared, then you can vary temperature and go from ballistic regime to the viscous regime and uh, look at uh, how current uh, profile in the constriction changes and in the ballistic regime. So, so this is calculated by solving, uh, solving equations that we talked about yesterday. In the ballistic regime, uh, current distribution is flat, as it should be, because electrons come uh, with equal probability through every point of the cross section, and then, uh, then when you when mean free path becomes shorter than the constriction width, you get this behavior that you know, transforms from flat to uh, parabolic with finite offset, and then in the limit of mean free path being much shorter than the width, it, it becomes a semicircle, right? And so, so that that that's a nice. Uh, I think n a, a nice behavior that may be interesting to probe experimentally in, yeah. A question, so in, in this geometry, it's very special geometry because if you think about it as a special case of a channel, it's a channel of zero length, right? So you are comparing here LE to W, but yeah. not to L. And you know, uh, that's right. Here, here you see that basically at L equals zero in this geometry, you already have fully built hydrodynamics. So my question is like, for example, if at some point I start turning on electron-electron interaction in a channel, it would take some time to build up the, this profile, right? Uh, would you expect it also in this kind of flow that, uh, or, or it, it knows already from the far field? That yeah, okay, so, so we haven't, honestly, we haven't looked at uh, more realistic geometry when the, there is a finite length to the channel. Um, we can do it now, and there was no motivation three years ago because no one, no one tried to measure it. Uh, we can do it now, but l let me, before we talk about that, l let me show you something else. Uh, it is also interesting to discuss what happens if you, uh, instead of viscous uh, transport, you have ohmic transport. If you have ohmic transport, so, so you, you just, uh, your cu current field relation is, is the plain ohmic relation, forget about all the stuff that just drew the formula. Then, uh, it's very easy to calculate current distribution, and you find that it has sharp 
sharp peaks at the corners of the slit because there is current crowding near the corners, uh, same way as the electric field and electrostatic problem uh, becomes very singular near, near the metal tips. And then if you, and then here we have a knob, you, you can vary, I mean, you, you can vary momentum relaxing uh, 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 rate compared to electron-electron scattering rate. And you can go continuously from, uh, from uh, ohmic regime to viscous regime. And, uh, and, and you see transformation of that uh, distribution with, uh, with spikes um, at, at, the, at the edges to, to something that looks like um, a flattened semicircle. And it's flattened because of what we discussed yesterday. They, uh, it, when you have momentum relaxing scattering, uh, the, uh, there will be a length scale beyond which everything will look ohmic and distribution will be will be flat, but then at the length scale smaller than the square root square root of the electron electron scattering and momentum momentum relaxing scattering, uh, you start seeing viscous effects. And so you see that very nicely here. There is at large length scales it look, looks flat and the current is distrib distributed more or less uniformly and then and then near the corners you have that uh, that that's sort of sort of rounding. So so, so what, what I'm trying to say is that for experimental colleagues, actually, uh, you can learn a lot from 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 uh, mapping out current distribution in the cross section because it will tell you whether whether it's flat or whether it's curved in or whether it's curved out. It will tell you uh, tell you right away about what, you know what's what's going on mi mi microscopically. So so I agree I agree with what. Um, with what Shahal said about uh, looking at the details and finding boundary conditions from that. Now let me see what's this. Ah, okay, so this is the crossover from ohmic to ballistic. You, you can, I mean, you, there are three corners in the phase diagram. You can go ohmic ballistic, ohmic viscous, or ballistic viscous, and that, that's how ballistic viscous, uh, uh, ballistic ohmic crossover looks, right? And so, so all of that, I mean, th this is a junior thesis of how you, uh, who was lead author on that paper, th available in the public domain at MIT website somewhere. And uh, there are more, more pictures there if you, want, if you want to see that. So in the ohmic regime, if you look away from the constriction, you imagine two streams of current coming up out of this, because you have two peaks? Not I mean, the current will be squeezed into that constriction and will be coming out of it, but current density within the constriction will be maximal at the corners. But it won't proceed into the chamber also, like, uh, like in the point contact imaging experiment? No, it will spread out. There will be a fan, fan of current lines, and it will, it will yeah. Uh, so just, you know, to uh, comment on that. Okay, good. So we are, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so, so we are done, uh, we are done with uh, what we discussed yesterday, which was basically an, a long introduction to what I'm going to discuss today. Um, and um, that's a story about long-lived excitations uh, and uh, how, they, how they occur in a two-dimensional electron gas. And so these are the wonderful people with whom this work was done. And uh, Patrick is here in the back, um, and um, um, Andre was here, but he left uh, the day before yesterday. Uh, so, uh, so yesterday we, you know, we, we, we discussed transport in three-dimensional Fermi liquid, and we said uh, we said that there are two 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 two, re um, two regimes: ballistic that occurs at distances smaller than. Uh, then two-body collision mean free path and hydrodynamic that occurs at larger length scales. And uh, here, we, to understand transport, we should use micros microscopic picture, some you know, particle distribution, and write down transport equations. And, and in the hydrodynamic case, all, uh, all uh, harmonics of F, which are not conserved because of, because of fundamental conservation laws, um, Relax to zero, and a description will be will based on on the conservation laws. 
um, for velocity and particle, particle density. And uh, then, uh, and that's true in the three-dimensional Fermi liquid. And you know, in, in, in the previous talk, you, uh, you saw measurements of viscosity in helium-3, where this picture was very well, uh, very well established you know, 50 years ago, if not before that. Um, and um, so, um, so one, you know, one, one aspect of scattering in the Fermi liquid, which will be important for me today, is m momentum conservation. And whether momentum conservation uh, does or does not uh, provide, uh, d does or does not present uh, an obstacle for for angular relaxation. Uh, in, in the Fermi liquid uh, in 3D, uh, you can consider collision of two particles of the Fermi surface where two particles collide at, a, at any angle. And if they collide at some angle, uh, they have to conserve momentum, they have to conserve energy, and, and, and you can think that you know, that constrains possible scattering uh, processes by a lot, but uh, you can still convince yourself that two particles can scatter by large angle, uh, and uh, to do that, they basically do this: they they, they rotate about their common common total total momentum, and uh, go from you know some some angle on the Fermi surface to another angle on the Fermi surface. Not that angle is typically large, and so uh, so this this issue that momentum is conserved and the angles are not not random but constrained by momentum conservation uh, does not. Uh, does not prevent, does not produce any, uh, uh, tr tr does not create any trouble when we apply Landau argument to, to estimate the collision, collision scattering rate in three dimensions. And in, in two dimensions, it's going to be quite different. Uh, the reason is simply that if, you're, if your two particles are in, in the plane, then uh, they cannot do this. They cannot go out of the plane. But also, their total momentum cannot change when they, when they scatter. So they have to uh, they're kind of locked in this, uh, in this position. And because they're locked in this position, uh, they can only, so it's like shown in this picture, uh, they can only scatter by a small angle, uh, by a small angle within that KT broadened uh, Fermi surface. So in two dimensions, uh, the momentum, uh, momentum conservation will, will lock uh, particle, particle angles and make them nearly equal before and after scattering. Um, and uh, there will be, uh, you know, there will be this new behavior that uh, generic collisions do not provide an efficient mechanism for, uh, for angular relaxation. And as soon as you, I mean, we ran into, into that because you know P Patrick and I were you know thinking how to, uh, how to compute viscosity, and you know then once you start doing it, you see, you see right away that uh, generic collisions don't you know don't relax angles or relax angles, but only. Only a little bit, and not enough to, you know, not enough to generate anything, uh, anything uh, comparable to what helium three does, right? Uh, so, so then the question is whether, whether Fermi liquid fails c completely in two, two dimensional systems, or, or there is some way out. And it turns out that uh, there are other types of collisions which are not at the generic angle, but at, at in a head-on arrangement when two particles collide like like so. Then. Uh, in this case, uh, momentum conservation allows them to scatter anywhere on, on the, on the two-dimensional two-dimensional Fermi surface, uh, and we are uh, we can forget about it so long as so long as we are you know we, we're careful about which harmonics are allowed or not allowed to relax by this process, and um, and one can convince yourself uh, you can convince yourself that uh, if you take these harmonics. Uh, with different M's, then the even parity ones will be the ones that can relax by this process, and the odd parity ones ca cannot. Uh, simply because if you have an odd parity, odd parity harmonic, this picture is horrible. Um, <coughs> if you have an odd parity harmonic, then uh, then near each place on uh, opposite to every place on the Fermi surface where you have some particles, uh, there is a place. There is a place where you have holes, so these particles will have nothing here to scatter on by this uh, by this head-on process. Uh, whereas if M was even, then that wouldn't be the case. Then then there will be a bump 
opposite to every other bump and or deep opposite to every other deep and scattering wouldn't be uh, scattering by the scattering process wouldn't be a problem and so, so from that you uh, you conclude that uh, that uh, the excitations with different parity and the p to minus p will scatter uh, scatter at very different rates and uh, then so, so, so that, that that tells you right away that this the behavior of these of these numbers gamma m which are uh, relaxation rates for, for these harmonics will depend very strongly on whether m is even or odd. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then from that point, you, you, know, you, you want to understand uh, how, you know, how, how different are even and odd relaxation rates. Uh, and uh, there is a story about that, you know, that, that <coughs> some, some, of it, uh, some of it will, um, will come in the next few slides. But uh, the main result is that uh, th there is a fairly big ratio b by which the odd parity relaxation is slower than the even parity relaxation. And uh, that ratio is t, t over Fermi energy square. So it's the same, same reduction factor as in our discussion yesterday by which quasi-particle lifetime is enhanced by Pauli blocking in a three-dimensional Fermi liquid. And, n now, uh, and n now that, th that stands because that's just uh, energy uh, energy um, um, partition between p particle and uh, p particle whole extension that happens in the scattering. Uh, but then in addition to that, there is an additional f factor uh, of the same order of magnitude by, by which odd parity relaxation is suppressed compared to even parity relaxation. Okay? And so that, that's, that's kind of the main message of what we're talking about today. Uh, and um, let's see if there are any questions. So for the total scattering rate, what, does this substantially revise that result I quoted from Giuliani and Quinn in 2D? Um, yeah. But how, how substantially? <laughs> so, so we... Uh, which result? So, so I quoted an old result for uh, uh, Fermi liquid scattering rate in 2D. Uh, yeah, Giuliani. Yeah. So, I mean, th there is a long uh, history to that. I mean, uh, uh, there were two papers written simultaneously in 1971 yeah. uh, that derived that at zero temperature, but as a function of energy. So this was epsilon square log of 1 over epsilon. And then uh, the you know, temperature and energy were you know they they, they appeared intermittently. Uh, so 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 the, the thing is that uh, you can get quasi-particle lifetime in a very standard way, you know, many-body theory, uh, from imaginary part of self-energy. And uh, no matter in what hemisphere you are and you know what year, uh, recent or not so recent, you always get this result, right? Uh, and but uh, but uh, uh, the so, so, so it's an interesting question what, what this calculation is missing and why this calculation uh, d does uh, why why the slow modes do not show up in this calculation they, they they eventually will show up in this calculation when it's done properly I mean uh, a one line answer is that uh, when you consider decay decay uh, is a sum of contributions of all the decay ch channels. Yeah. Uh, and it's dominated by decay channels, which are fastest, yeah, yeah. right? So naively, I mean, uh, uh, the leading order result will not be even sensitive to the slow decay modes, right? right? But of course, it's hidden in that calculation somewhere and needs to be extracted, which, which has not been done yet, as far as, as, far as I know. But, but yeah, this would still uh, be roughly true for the even modes, right? And the odd modes would behave differently. So you have a kind of two types of... Yeah, yeah, but, but this, this calculation right? c calculates cumulative decay rate into everything, okay, right? Yeah. right? So, so if we... physics can still have two, two kind of fluids e even uh, living inside, run the decay fast. Yeah, one more, on that, more on that in a moment, yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, so... Experimentally, if you measure, for example, coherence of electrons due to electron-electron scattering, you would be sensitive to the odd modes, right? To the long-lived ones, if you're measuring what's left of uh, Okay, you, you may be right, but I'm, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not there yet. I, I, let's... 
So just, I just want to comment that experiments have measured this relaxation time, and it agrees quite well with Giuliani and Quinn and all the others. You mean Arpis? No, no, just coherence and as a function of temperature or energy. Well, but certainly but in ballistic then systems. Then you're sensitive to the fastest. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're not, yeah. sorry, Amir, Amir. I think you're sensitive to the slowest, because that's what leaves coherence, right? Whatever you're left, yeah. the, the coherence signature that you're measuring. Yeah, Amir, I, I, I'm sorry. L let's move on and get to, get to where, uh, where uh, we get some, um, uh, some phenomenology, and then, you know, th then see where uh, uh, how to connect the two experiments. I, mean, it, it, I, I don't think it's simple, but, but also m there may be in existing experiments something that uh, has already been observed. And you know, I have my hypothesis what that is, but I'm not going to tell you uh, that maybe, m maybe, maybe, is, m m maybe is related. But I, it, I think we are way far from, at this point, we're, we're not very close, pretty far from understanding that. I mean, maybe a month away. <laughs> uh, right. So, okay. So, so, so then, okay. So that, that's a, 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 a same thing, but with a nicer picture. Uh, you can uh, draw these modes on the computer, and then they look m much nicer on the blackboard. But the, the idea is the same. There are uh, there are her even even harmonics and odd harmonics, and and some even harmonics and odd harmonics are conserved because of microscopic conservation laws. And m, m equal 1 and m equal 0 are conserved uh, um, unconditionally. But then there are these harmonics which are, which are conserved with a very good approximation uh, because of that, uh, because of that um, m momentum uh, conservation blocking effect uh, that, that, that we discussed. And th those will be the odd parity harmonics. And uh, my interest would be to understand how they, uh, what the relaxation rates are and how they, uh, how they um, affect transport. Okay. Any, any questions here? Yeah. Maybe. I mean. Maybe ju just to make sure that we're all on the same page. L let me uh, show this picture, and then uh, so that th these are two particles in free space, no Fermi surface, and then for two particles colliding in free space. Uh, we know how to solve a problem. We go to the cent center of mass frame, and the center of mass frame collision is head-on. Energy is conserved, so it's also head-out. Uh, and uh, the, there is a kinematic circle you can draw uh, by taking the center of the circle at the center of mass, uh, momentum of the center of mass. Uh, and then uh, all possible scattering events can be represented by taking particle one, uh, going somewhere on that circle, and particle two will go to to the opposite point, and uh, so so in 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 a in a free space problem, uh, particles can go anywhere here. But if you now superimpose that with a Fermi surface, uh, you find that if th this particle is within kT near the Fermi level, uh, and the other particle also, you find that uh, most of the kinematic circle is blocked because uh, the, the states in it are filled and. As a result, the outer part will also be blocked because you have to scatter to the, to the opposite points. And so, so the only thing the particles can do here is to scatter by a little, by a small angle, which is a water of KTO from energy. And so, so that would correspond to a small angular step in each scattering event, uh, not a large step as, as in a Fermi liquid. And so that, that's why angular relaxation for, uh, for these processes is suppressed. Um, and um, therefore, uh, what we expect here is a new um, is a new um, hierarchy of length scales, and instead of the simple you know ballistic hydrodynamic, we expect that at uh, short distances we'll have uh, ballistic behavior, and then once we cross a length scale, which is the even harmonic relaxation rate, which is the Landau Fermi liquid uh, uh, um, t square one over t square more or less, uh, then we enter that that interesting regime where. E where even parity harmonics relax quickly, but odd harmo parity harmonics uh, don't don't relax, uh, uh, and and then there will be there will be some uh, range of length scales in which in which the harmonic uh, the in which the dynamics will be a m mixture or a combination of the ballistic behavior for odd parity harmonics and and uh, relaxational behavior for the even parity harmonics, and so that that's 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 what we want. 
Uh, that's what we want to understand. Right? And then, when, then when, when, when you go to, uh, to, to even larger length scales, you, you end up in, in that hybrid dynamic regime uh, that we discussed yesterday. And so, so that, that's how two dimensional Fermi liquids uh, be, behave. Um, uh, and so it is, it is interesting, and what we need to understand is how to describe this multi-scale dynamics and uh, what are the new equations of motion replacing, uh, replacing what we know in these two limits and what are manifestations. So let me, uh, let me take some time and walk you through that. Um, I mean, we don't understand many things, but we do understand something, and I'll tell you what we do understand. Um, OK. Right. So, so, so first, you know, a few words about the rates gamma m. It turns out that, that um, calculating these rates is a fairly difficult problem. Uh, there, are, mm, there have been attempts in the literature to do that type of calculation. The earliest attempt we are aware of is by Boris Leichtman uh, in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and then later on, uh, Gurji uh, and his collaborators at Harvard, try, uh, at Har Har Kharkov, uh, tried to do something similar. Uh, but I, I think I think you know what uh, uh, what you can read in the papers don't don't answer the basic questions, and so we had to you know start doing it start doing it by ourselves. And and so uh, so the outcome is here. I'm not going to. Uh, do all the details, uh, but just you know, the, just show the you know some some essential points. Uh, for even harmonics, you can do standard golden rule calculation using collision integral, like Joel Moore was showing yesterday, uh, and then from that collision integral comes out the Landau uh, t square t square rate. Um, and then if you try to, I mean, if you try to use that approach for odd parity harmonics, you uh, you see very quickly that you have, at, at least in t-square order, the rates are zero. And if you try to go beyond t-square order, then uh, naively you might think that this, this process of scattering at the generic angle at which you make small angular steps uh, will, give, will lead to angular diffusion with every, every collision happening at this rate, but then in, in, in the collision uh, every collision leading to an angular step, which is of order of T over Fermi energy, and then you can calculate effective diffusion coefficient over over the Fermi surface as the rate of the of the as as the rate for um, individual collisions times the angular step squared, and that will uh, and that will give you T to the fourth rate, and also it will give you M to the M square dependence on the angular harmonic, uh, and that. Um, and it's, and it's m squared because in the diffusion, uh, in the diffusion uh, equation you have a Laplacian. So here it will be Laplacian uh, on uh, on a circle, and Laplacian Fourier transform will, will become uh, m, m squared. So, so that, that's what you expect uh, from from this process. It turns out, however, that things are more interesting than that. That if you if you now think about collisions which are nearly head-on, then uh, these collisions may lead to larger angular steps. Basically, uh, basically the angular step for nearly head-on collision, uh, you can think about it as a, you know, in terms of geometric picture when you draw when you draw a straight line and ask uh, and ask about what, what's what's the length of the uh, ask about the length of the overlap of that straight line with that broad and Fermi surface, and you, you can see that it's a water square root of t, not not t, and so so for nearly head-on collisions you can uh, you can um, make bigger angular steps, and then if you uh, if you say that that, that, that that that's this correct step in this angular diffusion problem, uh, you find uh, you find that the rate should be t cube, not t squared, uh, not, to, not not t to the fourth, right? Uh, however, if you now think about it more carefully, you know, and ask Patrick about the details. Uh, they're, they're very interesting. Uh, you find that at this, uh, this leading order contribution uh, actually c cancels, and uh, what, what's going on here is not just one particle doing doing random walks in angles at, at this uh, with this angular step, but a two body uh, a two body uh, random process. One one particle scatters uh, from this point to that point, and the other scatters here, 
and, uh, the, and these angular steps are nearly equal at leading order. And so if you calculate, if you calculate their contribution to realization rate, you find that T cubed contribution uh, drops out. And the next leading contribution is uh, T to the fourth again. Uh, but now you have to consider uh, now you have to consider two particles doing this. So it's not it's not going to be m square anymore. And if you uh, if you uh, do everything properly and no time uh, absolutely no time uh, to do it on the board because it's a very difficult calculation, uh, you find that uh, you find that the rate is t to the fourth times m m to the fourth. All right, and m to the fourth uh, is counterintuitive, but uh, Wait, wait, it's delta theta squared against squared. Yeah, it's correct. It's square and then square. It's not a typo. So it's delta theta in the fourth power. Yeah, it's not a typo. It's what, what you see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, pictorially, it's because it's a two-body two body random walk. It's not, not, one, not, not, one, uh, not one particle doing random walk on angles, but two, two of them doing it, uh, doing it together. And that, that's what come out of it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Just a uh, uh, comment. I, I think that if, if you have uh, multiple valleys with different shapes, then you, you don't get this uh, uh, cancellation at t squared order for the odd uh, harmonics. So I mean, it might be interesting in, in uh, graphene where you have two valleys and they're kind of nearly circular. Yeah. And this effect might no, good, good. It's a, it's a great, well. great question. Again, we, we don't have a full full understanding of all the geometries. But uh, one can check that these arguments that w we're going through apply not only to circular Fermi surface, but to Fermi surface, which is weakly distorted. So it's stable under small yes. deformations of the Fermi surface, so long as they, they have even p to minus p parity, right. which normally Fermi surface uh, has because of time reversal symmetry. Uh, in graphene, of course, it's a little different because each, each pocket is not time reversal symmetric. The only time reversal symmetric in, in combination. Uh, and so there, there are some third order deviations from, uh, from a circular shape, but they're pretty small. And so so if, you, if you think about it carefully, um, um, it's not a problem. Now, if you, if, you go to, if you go to more complicated Fermi surface shapes, uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be some kind of breakdown of that at some critical radius of a Fermi surface. Uh, and what what will it be? I think it's an interesting question, but I don't have time and capacity to talk about it. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, but uh, but uh, anyways. So so what? W one thing we established is that there is hierarchy of uh, hierarchy of uh, time scales, and there are even harmonics that relax at a normal Fermi liquid rate, and odd harmonics that relax uh, relax much slower. And uh, th that, that's kind of the summary of, of, that, uh, of these rates. And uh, OK, so let's skip, skip this discussion. Uh, okay. Yep. Just a question about what you try to skip. So what is the contradiction between golden rule? We always know that. No, I, we already handled this question. Let, let's move on and get, get, I mean, I said everything. Everything I had to, everything I could. Um, um, Everything informative that I could say, I, I said already, and I'll, let's not just repeat it again. Uh, yeah, I think the, these calculations are good calculations, and they're getting getting the right answer, but it's not getting the whole the whole story. Um, right. So, so, so the summary for this part is that there are these uh, very long-lived modes, and that corresponds to <coughs> some. You can think about it. Uh, some emergent integrals of motion associated with odd parity harmonics, um, and then, um, and then the interesting thing to understand is whether whether these odd parity harmonics actually contribute to some uh, to some observables, and and naively uh, naively uh, one would say that uh, probably not because what uh, what practical people measure is the m equals zero harmonic, which is density, shahal and uh, m equal 1 harmonic, which is current, a mirror. Right? <coughs> and, uh, and m equal 3 does not contribute directly to anything, uh, to anything uh, th that is directly measurable. Uh, however, uh, however uh, let's, you know, let's look at, at it closer. Uh, so 
so what we, uh, what we have is that our degrees of freedom can be decomposed into even parity and odd parity parts. And then we expect that th those will be short-lived and those will be long-lived and therefore will dominate transport. And l let me give a simple argument for why, uh, oops, uh, for why they should dominate transport. Sorry, what's this? OK, never mind. Um, so why all high-order high harmonics matter? Uh, let me take that basis that I introduced yesterday when you take transport equation and then uh, write it down in the, in the circular harmonic representation. Uh, and uh, then uh, forget about electric field uh, driving transport, just take free, uh, f free equation and look, look at the modes. And uh, then for, for the collision operator, uh, I'll, 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 uh, I'll use some eigen values, gamma m, which will be high for the even harmonics and small for the odd harmonics. And then if you go to that basis, your transport equation looks, uh, looks like um, a tight binding model in this basis. And the hopping between different harmonics is provided by the streaming term. So this happens because if you, if you write down the streaming term in Fourier space. By streaming, you mean Vigrat? The advection term the okay. in Russia, in English, is stri streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, in, um, so, so KV you can write down as uh, KX plus I KY V e to the minus I theta. Like so, where x and y, kx and ky are components of the wave number, theta is the angle is the angle on the Fermi surface, and so, so and, and then uh, this combined with the relation that e to the minus i theta i m theta equal m minus one theta is telling telling you that. Uh, th that th th this shifts, you know, th th this operator shifts m harmonic to m minus one harmonic, or, and then this term will shift it to m plus one harmonic, and so that th that's how that uh, that hopping uh, hopping uh, comes about. Uh, now, now let's take these equations seriously and try to solve them in the limit uh, when odd odd parity harmonics do don't relax at all, right? And then in this limit, uh, there are sites where gamma m are zero. So, so in this problem, gamma m plays a role of on-site potential in a tight binding model, right? And so there are odd parity sites, sites where gamma m is zero, and there, uh, particle will, if particle is there, it wouldn't relax at all, but, but it's coupled to the even parity sites, and then from even parity sites, uh, again, to the odd parity sites. And so, so it's not, not very clear what's going to happen, uh, but uh, but if you, if you think about it carefully, you see that there are these dark states that you can construct, which are delocalized over all odd parity sites and vanish on the even parity sites, which are decaying, right? And so the, these dark states, they uh, satisfy this, their eigenstates of this equation with omega equals zero eigenvalues. So they don't, uh, they, they have infinite relaxation time in this, in the approximation when this, when this, this is vanishing. And then these states also, um, I mean, they, they, they extended and they couple all odd harmonics together and also they overlap with, uh, with m equal minus one plus one harmonics. So they, uh, they will contribute, to, they will contribute current, to current. And also you can see, if you look a bit close into that, that, uh, that there are slow, slowly relaxing states close to this one. So, so there's a continuum, continuum of slowly relaxing states that couple, couple different odd parity harmonics. And the coupling is provided by spatial inhomogeneity, essentially, right? And so that, that's, that, that's why all the parity harmonics are, uh, are, are important. Uh, and um, oh, let's, let's not worry about that. About that. Uh, now, if we want to see their contribution to response functions, we, we can use this approach that we, uh, we discussed yesterday. And, uh, and this formula for continued fraction, continued fraction expression for Conductivity it comes about basically um, by solving these equations. You have to add electric field back in these equations as a source, and then solve them, solve these equations recursively. And if you do that, 
uh, if you do that, uh, you, you, you get pretty quickly uh, con non-local conductivity, which uh, as a function of k is given by this continued fraction. Uh, continued fraction, and I mean, there is some difference. And it appears that there is some difference in the factors compared to, to, to this expression. But actually, there isn't. If you massage, massage it a little bit, this, uh, these two are identical. Right. So, so what you find here is that conductivity is very non-local, and you can, and there are different regimes that uh, one can explore. Um, and uh, we did most of that yesterday. If you go to spatially uniform case k equals zero, then uh, you get the Drude form, uh, Drude relation, and gamma one is momentum relaxation uh, rate. Uh, if you if your momentum relaxation is absent in the bulk, then uh, then uh, non-locality is inevitable, and if you are in a very long wavelength limit, then uh, then you can drop this this part and then uh, and then extract from this expansion. Uh, leading k squared term will give you uh, will give you viscosity in that hydrodynamic limit, but everything in between in that in in that regime where odd parity harmonics are long lived and even harmonics are relaxing uh, must must be studied using the full full k dependence. And it is, it is viscosity is determined by gamma 2 in the long wave limit. Right? That's right. Yeah, so that, that's what we had yesterday right here. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so, so, so I don't want to talk about these two you know, simple limits. The, the interesting thing is what happens, uh, what happens in this intermediate limit, limit intermediate regime. So, so in, this regime, in this regime, you have to analyze the full k dependence. And if you do that, um, what comes out is viscosity, which is a function of k, it, it's, it's non-local. Non uh, sorry, it means that viscosity is a function of the length scale on which you probe the system. And uh, this uh, m to the fourth power in the angular relaxation, which some people call superdiffusion, it translates into, it translates into uh, one third power in viscosity dependence on k. Um, and um, yeah, and then uh, one can use that to calculate uh, to calculate uh, the current profile in the strip, and the way the way this can be done is um, sketched here. Let me see if we have time for that. Yeah, maybe one minute. Okay. So 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 if, if we uh, if we have a strip, and we want to to understand how current flows in the strip. Uh, we have to combine our non-local conductivity with approach with boundary conditions, and <clears throat> and the way we handle boundary conditions, uh, same as what we discussed yesterday, is um, by using some you know makeshift boundary conditions in which we uh, in which we replace the actual boundary by by some fictitious by, by some fictitious electric field which is added into this equation. And this fictitious electric field will be proportional to the current density on the boundary. So I'm going to treat, I'm going to you know, extend my problem in the entire, in the entire plane, and maybe add extended periodically, maybe more convenient, right? And then in that problem in which uh, in uh, which I have boundaries that form a periodic array, uh, my current relaxation will occur at each boundary. At a rate, uh, at a rate proportional to some alpha, which is my boundary condition parameter, and uh, and momentum relaxation, momentum relaxation at the boundary at the rate proportional to current, you know, means means that I effectively have some uh, some electric field which is which is negative uh, ne negative um, alpha times current on each boundary, and now if I take that field and put into this equation, uh, I can just Solve the problem by you know because in full plane and it's periodic I can do simple Fourier transform, uh, simple Fourier transform and write down current current density uh, as a Fourier transform with harmonics corresponding to the period W, which is the width of the channel, and then uh, for these Fourier harmonics you get you get couple lin linear equations and you, you solve them. Uh, you solve them, and uh, and and the local conductivity arises as an input in that solution, and you can write down current profile 
uh, as some kind of sum of uh, harmonics times non-local conductivity evaluated at kn, at kn, which are uh, which are here. Um, and then if you, if you got some dependence of k, then this equation will predict for you how a current prof profile will, will look like in a strip. And if you take, if you take sigma of k um, of that form with, with viscosity being a constant, so it will be just 1 over k square, you'll get this standard parabolic profile. Um, and if instead you take uh, viscosity, which is a power law function, you get you get something which is closely uh, resemble uh, that resembles closely the two thirds two third power of Poise uh, Poise um, flow. Okay, so so that's that's what we expect, and then you know uh, one can extend that to you know to, to, to conductivity and to conductance of a strip and uh, get get the width dependence and the um, and the width dependence also will be some fractional power which will be uh, which will be somewhere in between the ballistic, uh, ballistic power law and, and the Gurji power law, and actually pretty similar to what Andy measured, but I'm sure it's not, <laughs> not directly related. Uh, but <laughs> but, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so, so this, is, this is a su summary for that. You, you, can, uh, you can start with non-local conductivity and then Sol solve the problem for the current profile, current profile on the strip, and then in uh, you know the mm, in in the conventional viscous limit you get a parabola, and then and and then uh, if you are, if you have this odd parity relaxation uh, rate uh, added in, then you get then you get a different profile. I mean, it all goes to zero at the edge. I'm sorry, because these boundary conditions. Uh, after we do calculation, uh, we take alpha to infinity to make sure that so it doesn't even appear in the, in the final answer, because this is written in the limit when alpha is t taken to infinity. So th this is in the limit when uh, when relaxation when momentum relaxation in the boundary is complete. Every time particle arrives at the boundary, its momentum is uh, momentum is forgotten. Right. Uh, if you keep alpha finite, then there'll be some finite, I mean, finite offset similar to mm, what people, people see in the measurements, but not, uh, not in this what picture. What you argued from m equal to 4, your p is 4. Why you try p equal to? Um, because people ask. I mean, what, what happens if you have? No, no. What happens if you, you make have? Make people hit their yeah. uh, What happens? No. I, also for myself. I mean, what, what happened? What would happen if it was a simple angular diffusion? Would it be, would it be different or would it be similar? And how how similar? How different? Uh, and, uh, angular diffusion is very well known in solid state physics. Electron phonon scattering usually re leads to. Uh, the, the, these are the classic classic papers of Gurje and Kapilevich that discussed in Landau Lipschitz and well know about diffusion over, over Fermi surface, uh, described by angular diffusion equation. And, and it's a, you know, not something that was discussed in this meeting, but it's something that you know, um, solid state theory is very high on. Um, so, so we have to uh, obey. Um, anyway, so, so let's maybe skip that. So, so th this was j just a different way to uh, obtain the same results and uh, maybe slightly more intuitive it can be can be left for questions uh, so let's talk lastly about manifestations and see how much time we have oh okay um, so so manifestations uh, of this behavior uh, which are fairly simple to predict and maybe not so hard to test as well um, are, w one is re retro reflection, and th that uh, that basically can be explained using this picture. Suppose I inject a test particle in my in my system, and t test particle means that I have a bump on the Fermi surface, and I can write this distribution as a statistical mixture of an even part and an odd part. Where here I added a pocket of holes uh, to compensate for this added pocket of particles. And then uh, when I turn on my dynamics, th this one will, will relax, th this one will relax, and this one will be, will be long-lived. Uh, and so what it means is that after one collision, after one head-on collision, 
or few head-on collisions, uh, you generate a new distribution in which there is a beam of holes which goes back to your uh, to the direction f uh, f from which you in injected your test particle, right? So you get a fermionic jet of holes that uh, that uh, is back reflected, and it looks you know lo looks a lot like Andreev scattering, but of course it's stochastic and not phase coherent. We don't have a superconductor here, but uh, but the entire phenomenology is not not so different from Andreev scattering as as you'll see. So so this back reflection. Uh, that you get back reflected, back, back reflected holes, just, you know, just to uh, make, make this uh, clear one more time, uh, is a purely classical effect. It's something that is familiar, for instance, for, uh, from mirror, you know, pairs of mirrors or triplets of mirrors that we use, that are used to make corner reflectors that, that are used in protective clothing, um, or uh, what happens in the eye, what people in photography call red eye, uh, when you shine light, then the light is focused on the back of your eye, and then, and then back reflected, and then comes out as a uh, as a parallel beam uh, going directly from where you shine light. And so, no no matter from where you shine light, you get you get this back reflected beam. It's a purely classical purely classical effect. And if if you wish, in our case, the Fermi surface, the circular Fermi surface, uh, acts as a as an eyeball. Here and pr produces that that back back reflection, right? Now, if you do uh, now if you do calculation, you can actually you know, uh, try to do calculation and calculate angular distribution. You see all of that. Uh, so this is a golden rule calculation taking some uh, taking some uh, uh, model for potential details of your interaction are not very important because the whole thing comes comes from behavior near the Fermi surface with characteristic momentum transfer being relevant as a order to Kf. Uh, and so as so long as we have potential uh, non-zero at 2 Kf, uh, other details don't, don't matter. Uh, you can calculate angular distribution of what comes out if you inject a particle. And you see very nicely that in this angular distribution, there is, uh, there is a small angle part, and then there is uh, th there is some fl flat part, uh, angle independent part, and then, and then also there is uh, there is a negative, uh, an, a negative um, um, component in the distribution. That means, th which means that holes beam back to uh, from where you inject the particle. <coughs> right. So these are backscattered hole jets, and they. Uh, so, so this is one idea how they can can be probed. Uh, using what how we, we usually think about Andreev scattering, uh, how we usually probe Andreev scattering, uh, you can uh, you can add a magnetic field. Uh, sorry, this is not to scale, but I mean uh, should be slightly c corrected. So, so th th don't look at the scale; just l listen to me. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the, so the idea is that if you if you inject particles from a probe into the system and then and then look, uh, look uh, sorry, from injector into the system, and then uh, look at particles which are collected by a probe. Uh, then, in the purely, in the non-interacting case, there is this very well-known phenomenon, which is magnetic focusing. Uh, when you, know, you inject particles, and then magnetic field is such that uh, there is a mag uh, cyclone orbit diameter that fits between injector and probe, uh, and um, and then you get you know, a spike of current here, you know, when uh, when magnetic field is precisely that that value, and then for double that value you get you get a second resonance and then third resonance, so forth. So there's a whole sequence of resonances, uh, magnetic focusing that you get. But now if you if you apply magnetic field of the opposite sign, so that it curves electrons this way, right? Uh, then magnetic focusing won't happen. But instead, uh, what's going to happen is that you will split electron hole trajectories, and you'll have the steering. Steering effect. You will you, your electron trajectories will curve one way, and the backscattered holes will curve the other way. And you can steer holes to the probe uh, by magnetic field, which is of the opposite sign to to the field at which at which at which you see focusing. And so the prediction is that you will um, th there will be some uh, characteristic magnetic field dependence that one can predict, uh, and the peak, which will not be sharp, but there will be a steep, steep magnetic field dependence. And uh, because you collect holes, not electrons, the signal will, will be negative. So the prediction is that there will be a negative voltage response 
which is sharply enhanced at anti lower at magnetic field of an anti lorentz and sign and magnetic field that you need for that is classically weak so you need, you need magnetic field which is uh, much weaker than the field at which you see you see focusing and, and you can understand it basically from this picture uh, to get focusing you need to curve trajectory all the way and to get to get the steering effect you just need to split electron hole trajectory slightly provided that lee is much greater than the distance from from injected to to the probe okay and so that's uh, th that's the experiment that uh, we are proposing to see that um, and uh, yeah, so, sounds very doable. Uh, uh, about anti lorentz sign, is it with respect to electrons or to holes? With respect to focusing. To focusing of holes? No, focusing. So, so th th this is focusing of electrons. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I take, sorry, I take, take electron to have a positive charge. I assume that we inject positive charge okay. and then okay. holes. Uh, I, I worried about sign of electron charges. In reality, it's negative, but I, I ignore that. So, so I assume that we inject electrons, and electrons have some charge, unspecified. Uh, and then if they focus here, then, uh, then uh, there will be a signal of the opposite charge sign when, when you get holes. Mm -hmm. So it's not, yeah, I mean, l let's take the sign of charge out. And about focusing peak, because for it's only intuitive for the holes, the focusing box in intu an in intuitive way only for holes, that you're focusing holes and getting peak. But if you speak about focusing of electrons with negative charge, it's not so well, straight. It's, it follows the formalism calculations, but... Well, I mean, charge is easy to take into account. So, so in graphene, in graphene, if you apply some magnetic field, if you, you're on the electron side of the direct point, uh, you see magnetic focusing for one sign of magnetic field. If you're on the whole side of the Dirac point, you will see magnetic focusing for the other sign of the uh, magnetic field. And then this effect will appear for the magnetic field of the opposite sign to where you see focusing. Okay. Both electron side and the whole side. Because when you inject holes, then your holes convert into electrons, and then you get, you get uh, these guys will be holes and these guys will be electrons, but overall the picture will not change. So, so the sign at which you see the effect in magnetic field will always be the opposite to where you see focusing. I see. No matter whether you inject electrons or holes and what not. Um, okay, so yeah, I think we are. Oh, okay, we are all over. Right, so maybe uh, we can skip that and, I mean, w one can look, let me just <laughs> say one, one sentence, w one, can look, uh, one can look at the heat, heat flow due to back reflection and find, find, not surprisingly, that, uh, that this back reflected uh, beam uh, is a beam of cold because it brings holes and therefore, not surprisingly, it, brings, uh, it acts as rays, uh, rays of cold. Uh, and so that, that's a simple calculation that can be that we are now doing, and more on that uh, more, more on that on the archive later this month. Um, so so the summary is that in this head-on collision regime we have uh, we have um, emergent emergent uh, uh, conserved quantities due to slow anomalously slow odd parity modes, and the behavior behavior that we have is hy half hydro, half, half ballistic, and that give ri gives rise to transport coefficients, which are scale dependent. And, um, and uh, there are interesting new effects that we expect in this regime. There we expect to see strong nonlinear effects, because every, every time you have slow modes, you can activate them. Uh, slowly decaying modes, you can activate them, and they will because they live long, any nonlinearity has, has a long time to develop. Uh, and so we expect that in this regime, there will be strong, strong nonlinear coupling uh, between different modes. And you know, that, that's something that can be, can be understood. And from that, from that, there may be some interesting applications and nonlinear phenomena. And thank you very much.
Are there any thermodynamic consequences of this? I mean, could this show up in uh, a Moranchik instability or? In a, in a, I mean, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, um, So, okay, so, so Pomeranchuk is interesting. I mean, we thought about it not, uh, not in terms of these modes helping Pomeranchuk, but in terms of Pomeranchuk helping to see these modes. Because if you, if you have a Fermi surface distortion due to Pomeranchuk, yeah. um, there will be additional coupling between different harmonics. And so that will, th that will show up in, I mean, this non-local conductivity will change, and it will, it, will, it will show up in an interesting way. So we thought about it from that point of view. But you know, whether, whether it goes the other way as well, I, I don't know. When you calculate a susceptibility, it sort of, you're integrating over imaginary time. Things are long. Yeah, yeah. So that, I think Andy, Andy was interested in that. Maybe we should talk about it later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. So this uh, dependence at uh, goes like one over k to the power of one third. This is only in the regime, so not for too small k, and not for too large k in this regime, which you call tomographic. So if uh, the width of the channel is very large, then Poiseuille flow would be restored, it would be parabolic. Or not? Yeah. OK, so the, so the formula you had there with was for this regime, the Poiseuille formula. Uh, uh, width of the channel is very large, but we're not, we, didn't, we haven't yet hit the momentum relaxing <coughs> processes. But if it is, okay, but momentum relaxing you mean uh, like impurities or something? Yeah. But if it is very large, then shouldn't, should not uh, the viscosity uh, for k equals zero somehow determine this, the whole transport? If, if the width of the Poiseuille channel is very large, mm -hmm. Then is it, it isn't it the the k equals zero limit of the viscosity? Sure. Which, yeah. Okay. So it should be was very. Yes. Yeah, so, so so this power law was at k, which is much larger than that c crossover. Yeah. <coughs> Since th this has like two families of relaxation times, one of them are almost zero and. <coughs> Uh, the other one behave so, so it's like semi hydrodynamic semi ballistic thing right mm -hmm. can you hope to construct some sort of theory of a fluid interacting with something that would mimic this behavior or um okay so so i learned yesterday at uh Kamran Benjes talk that when viscosity depends on length scale, this is called non-Newtonian fluid, right? So this is kind of like that. And the pictures he was showing, the profile that had interesting shape, and he, he said that you know, the, the, uh, those uh, guys, uh, Morozov and company, attributed to, to non-Newtonian flow of phonons. I mean, it's kind of similar here. So, so you can say that effectively the cl classical fluid a non-Newtonian classical fluid in which uh, viscosity depends on length scale. I mean, usually non-Newtonian means that viscosity depends on shear. And here, his talk and also here, uh, viscosity was scale dependent. So it's an example of a non-Newtonian fluid. From uh, I'm not sure if it answers your question, but. Yeah. Why is it called tomographic? Yeah, I forgot to say that. So, uh, so in, in, um, so in this dynamics, if you if you don't stop at um, one collision process, if you go back um, here somewhere, uh, you get um, you inject a particle, it col uh, collides head on, becomes a hole. And then this hole goes back, becomes a particle, goes back, uh, becomes a hole, goes back, becomes a particle. So, uh, so, so the, uh, the transport equation that if you derive, and I you know, didn't have time to talk about that, um, uh, the transport equation for the odd parity, for the odd parity modes looks like a one-dimensional diffusion along velocity direction uh, combined with angular relaxation 
at the rate which is that t to the fourth gamma prime. And if you forget about this rate, then, uh, then the in this dynamics, different slices will decouple. And that's what tomography is. You, you, you do tomo I mean, in medical imaging, you do tomography slice by slice in different directions, and then, then you do Fourier transform, and then you get, get the full image. And so, so this is very similar. And so, so this is what in, you know, in, in, in the literature on bosonization of Fermi surface, uh, I think by Haldane. <coughs> Haldane was first to call it tomography you know, a long Alan time. Luther. Alan Luther, sorry. Alan Luther was the first. <laughs> sorry. No, I, I, I remember it from Haldane, but yeah. yeah. I have a, because you mentioned a question about sort of turbulence. I, I mean, it's not ob in this equation, is it obvious sort of where the nonlinearity arises from? Like, are which of these terms, d gamma prime, is not linear in, or not zero order in delta f? Not I guess you have something linear here, but I'm just wondering whether the nonlinear terms in your sort of effective theory would be, be large or not. So the, the fee, okay, so, so th this does not, I mean, th this is not yet ready to discuss, I am not ret yet ready to discuss nonlinear non terms. But my understanding of it since, you know, since you asked, thank you very much, is that, uh, is that what's going to happen is that if you have some, uh, some, uh, some bump, some, some distortion of the Fermi surface, which, uh, which will, uh, you know, which is um, odd parity, then, uh, then you can think about it that, you know, your Fermi surface, because, because you know, there is a wave on it, um, is not p to minus p symmetric anymore. And so on that background, on that background, which is provided by small delta f, uh, the pr scattering processes that are beyond those head-on, uh, scattering processes that were forbidden by momentum relaxation for p to minus p symmetric Fermi surface are now allowed. So if we now, if we now account for these processes, which will, they will happen on that slightly, uh, Fermi surface slightly perturbed in the odd parity di direction, uh, then, uh, then there will be a nonlinear relaxation effects, which will be different from what we talked about here. Okay, and then, so, so that, that's, that's kind of what we're tr trying to do. I guess just to add a little bit to that, I think this like algebraic thing that would mean it would come from the collision operator. Well, of course, but yeah, from, like but from yeah, I mean that was sort of my question: is would you would you expect the nonlinear effects from the collision operator to be significant in any way? But uh, usually, okay, no, I. I I have I share your doubts. I mean, uh, shared your, your doubts. Usually, nonlinear effects coming from collision operator uh, uh, don't, don't arise, right? But but in this case, because there are uh, because for those p to minus p symmetric cases, there are some some modes which are explicitly don't relax because the structure of collision operator. If you perturb away from p to minus p symmetry, new channels open up, and th that's nonlinearity. Okay. If there are no more questions, then let's head to lunch. Thank you.